Welcome everyone. It is a wet, damp, cold morning here in Toronto. It was beautiful all week and suddenly it's dull and dingy today. So I guess it's a good day to be inside. Anyways, um, let's just start today. I don't know how well you're feeling. It's been a sort of a reset week for me. Um, February is always a month that I, I really like to do without. If we could just skip from January to March, I would be happy. Um, but we did have QuiltCon. I attended QuiltCon on, um, online last week, and I found it was a really good moment just to take a good look at my quilting, where I want it to go, uh, take the inspiration from it, and deal with new ideas. And uh, yeah, it was a good reset week. So there's no, there was no video yesterday as I was working through all these things. So I did ask online for a couple of questions, and these are great just to get us going, but I've got Samantha in the background, and if you have questions, just put them in the chat, and she is going to feed them to me. On Facebook, we got, do you ever mark quilts before quilting? What do I use? What do, how do I mark? And what do I mark? So marking on top of a quilt, so we're talking about when you're doing the, the quilting on top, excuse me, of course you don't want any of those marks remaining after you've done all your quilting. I don't have a, a lot of experience with the washable blue marker, but I know online in the quilting forms, uh, those long-term long-arm quilters say that's the only one they use. That's the one if you want guaranteed, no coming back of the mark, that's the one you use. But I don't have one of those, so I often will use a friction pen. But because the friction ink, it disappears with heat, but it also can leave a little bit of a silhouette. I don't do great big lines um, with the friction pen. I'm usually just doing dots for those dot to dot print, um, dot to dot quilting. And that's how I mark my quilt. Now, my quilting skills, as I have learned, are not as high as I thought they were. Sometimes I chicken out and I don't quilt as much or um, the way I should. So that's one of my goals for this year is to become a better quilter. But that's how I mark my quilt. This is from Haiti Draper. Do I have any tips on how to keep a quilt free of smudges, scuffs, and dirt in the making process? I don't have a lot of problems with my quilt top while I'm working with it. I do make sure I don't eat in my quilting room so there's no crumbs or things like that. I make sure I wash my hands before I quilt so there's nothing on my hands to quilt. But there's certainly a lot of dust around and things like that. So in the piecing part, I don't find there's a lot of difficulty. I find that it's as the quilt gets bigger and bigger and it begins to drag, that's when I find that there's an issue with dirt and dust. And I just try to keep my space clean. Um, I keep my floor swept uh, under my long arm. I keep it uh, vacuumed. And I just really try to keep the surrounding place clean so it doesn't come on top. Uh, there's a lot of lint and fine dirt that gets on a quilt while you're making it, and that's just a process of um, making. So have a lint brush nearby. That will get rid of a lot. Uh, last week, uh, Stephanie uh, Hackney, my interview with her, she said that somebody mentioned using old batting scraps to help get off some of those smudges, and it helps. So those are three tips. Hope you can use them. See-Through Bluestone has asked, how do you use a quilt on a bed? Is it decoration that is removed when it's bedtime or perhaps it lies on top of the sheet so it's part of the bedding? So it may sound like a simple question to begin with, but it truly is you and your relationship to the quilt. Uh, there are some quilts with lots of very intricate, uh, fine workmanship that you don't want to be using. If, if you put it on your bed, there's gonna be friction attached to it, right? Because you're sleeping, you're moving things around on top of it, um, and people sit on top of the bed or whatever. So there's gonna be wear and tear on it. So if it's a very intricate quilt, uh, perhaps it's just decoration on your, on your bed. Um, but so far I have not made any of those. My quilts have all been with the intention of being used. So it either can work, either can, can do it. So it, it's your, your choice. And I do have uh, sheets on top of it. 
So I have, I actually have two quilts on my bed, a sheet, and then uh, the fitted sheet underneath it. So the, the, the upper sheet just prevent, uh, helps keep the dirt, for lack of a better word, uh, from your body away from your quilt. I've got several questions. One came through the um, through Taylor and Betty has asked it online. She was in the process of researching for a new sewing machine and she wondered how I came to the decision of about mine. So I have two machines. I have a 30 year old Bernina and I have a five year old Ber Bernina. Um, my old one is lovely. I absolutely love it. And I would have just sewn with that one with the exception of the older machines have smaller harps on it. That is the opening between the needle and the motor on the side. What I was looking for in my new machine was a bigger harp so I could do some free motion quilting on my sewing machine. Part of it was um, my cousin had a brand new version of the, uh, this machine and I had it was available to me to buy secondhand. So those were two big factors because my biggest, biggest advice for anyone looking for a new machine is to buy the machine you can afford. So if you don't have any money, ask your aunts, your grandmothers, uh, your sisters, your cousins, whatever, does anybody have a sewing machine um, that they can use or borrow? Uh, and from there, go with what you can. Because remember, like 95% of all your sewing is just going to be a straight stitch. But there are some features on my new machine that I do like, and it's nice to have. Um, I have a leg lift, so that means there's um, a bar right at my knee that I can use to lift the pressure foot up and down. There was um, a thread <laughs> threader. It took me six months to learn how to use it, and now it's broken. Um, it's a very fragile little thing, uh, but I'm going to wait until things open to get my machine cleaned, and I'll have them repair that at that point. Um, I could do without the electronics, like I, I would the electronics on it. Um, fiddling with the stitch numbers and having 5,000 stitches to choose from, that's not a big selling feature for me. Um, it has a better light, bigger light, and a bigger surface. So th those were the big things for me. In um, And of course, it was affordable because it was secondhand. Um, and people, just as another note, people often ask me what brand to buy, and I just cannot comment on that. I just have not used a lot of machines. Another really big important factor with uh, your sewing machine is buy a machine where you know you can get service and support. I know another machine may be a little bit better, but if you do not have that local support and those sewing machine classes to take and that person you can call up and say, you know, I'm having this problem today, you know, what, what do you think I should do? Uh, go with the machine that you can do that with because it'll be a lot less of a headache in the end. From Taylor, do I take machine into a professional for cleaning and maintenance? And if so, how often? I usually take it in every year. I uh, there's just dirt and dust. Even though I clean it uh, rigorously every week, uh, it gets into the back of the machine, and that needs to be cleaned out. And there's timing issues. That's the two things that your your yearly maintenance, the two big things that they'll do. They'll get into the, the parts of the machine that you can't oil, grease, and clean them, and they'll make sure that your timing is, is there. And the timing is just your needle going down and when the thread from the bobbin. Those two things have to be in sync, and they get out of sync when you hit not with every pin you hit, but by hitting pins or when you get that needle jammed and it breaks in the middle, you know, all those things can send off your timing. So I do it once a year. If you touch your sewing machine twice a year, that may be a little too often for you. You may do it every two or three years, but I sew every week, at least once, <laughs> sometimes much more. And I do many days when I'm sewing, you know, in my sewing room for six or eight hours at a time. And 
you know, that produces a lot of lint that I cannot access. That's one of the disadvantages with my new machine is I cannot access as many parts of the machine as I did with the other one. And they've got a special screw that I cannot get in with a special screwdriver. And I think that's just making sure that people don't get in there and wreck things. So, um, <laughs> that I take mine in once a year. Now, COVID has stopped me from uh, getting my machine uh, clean this year. So it is a little bit late. And I'm also hearing that they're very backlogged with um, at the uh, repair people. So that's another thing that has discouraged me from taking it in. Um, Susie Drury has asked, I've watched the video, my color series videos, that's what she's referring to, and she's still in a muddle about the difference between saturation and volume. Can you give me the idiot's version, please? Okay, so saturation, um, let me just go here. So I brought in a prop. So, you can download, I've made these charts and you can download them on my website. So uh, there's one for every color. So um, saturation just means this is the pure hue over here. This is white, this is black. And when you desaturate it, you're taking the color out of it. So you're coming over to this white line. That's what desaturation, that's what desaturation refers to um, and saturation. So if you're talking about a saturated color, you're talking about a very vibrant, true to the hue color. If you're talking about a desaturated color, you're looking towards a gray um, or, you know, it just looks washed out. It looks like, you know, it's been through the wash thousands of times or whatever. So let me just show you two different versions here. So here is a very saturated blue. Here is a less saturated blue. And once you get to a gray, so this is very a gray with just a little bit of blue in it. So that's saturation. Volume... Volume really isn't a, a term that you use to describe color. It's more about how you describe fabric. And of course, volume is something that we use to describe liquids. So it's, it's a different type of term and it can mean something different to different people. But in fabric, mostly what we're talking about is about um, colors that don't carry a lot of weight to them. So they're, ca they're called low volume. And often they're white on white or cream on cream. Um, this is just a selection that I actually purchased as a low volume bundle because I do not naturally, um, <laughs> I don't go to these in the store. Uh, so I need help having somebody else grab them for me because they're so often needed in the background. But low volumes also, have a flavor to them. So like this one, it looks like a desaturated orange. This is going to that very far, a lot of color has been pulled out of this one. Where this one's more of a desaturated purple. Uh, you, can, you can't see it through here, but if I held it up to something, actually if I held it up to this orange, you can see that they're, even though that they are very pale, they, they, um, come from a, a different source to begin with. So it adds a lot of flavor to the back of your quilt when you're doing um, just a uh, low volume back. So I hope that helps. In general, if they're asking for a, a low volume print, just look for your lightest prints with um, sort of a tone on tone print to it instead of like a blue on a cream or a black on a white. I have a 75 to 100 year old quilt top from my grandmother or great grandmother. Would it be weird to quilt it on my long arm? She doesn't do hand quilting. Um, no, you can print quilt that on your long arm. Just be careful because the older the fabric, the more fragile it is. I would go on to a Facebook page where there's more experienced quilters and they can probably give you some pointers on how to handle that cotton because it will be delicate. And of course you want to do your best work. So.
I actually have a couple of, um, I think they're probably 50 or 60 year old quilt tops in my pile to do. Um, they're not that precious. They were really scraps that they were used, but I can see there's lots of threads that are coming undone and things like that, that you just have to repair before you sit down and do um, the quilting. Um, have I ever used quilting rulers with my regular machine? Yes, but you must be very careful. Um, there is a quilting foot that has a little bit of a ledge. I don't have a quilting ruler at hand here, but quilting ruler rulers are thick and there's a special foot that is designed to work with them. Um, but you may not have that for your machine. And I cannot stress enough the damage <laughs> that might happen to your machine if that ruler slips underneath your needle and it jams your machine. Um, so you have to be very, very careful when you use quilting uh, rulers with your regular feet. Um, or with like an embroidery foot or a darning foot. Uh, try to buy that ruler foot to prevent the damage to your machine. Now that said, I have definitely done it with a regular, um, not a regular foot, like a, my Bernina has a stitch regulator which means I get a more even stitch as I, I do my free motion quilting and that does not have a ruler foot um, at, attachment for it. So. I've had to be very, very careful when I'm using that ruler that I am pushing it through the right way. Somebody says, I'm a terrible free motion quilter on my sewing machine, so I am now experimenting with quilt as you go. Good idea? Yeah, that's an excellent idea. That's a, that's a, uh, a person who's experimenting, trying to figure out uh, what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, free motion quilting, if you're still frustrated with it on your machine, just realize that it is just a full, like it's just practice and muscle memory and figuring out how to do things. Um, one way that you can practice is to doodle. I think I've shown this last month. Um, you know, I just keep doodling, coming up with different patterns and just being able to repeat it. And I am really surprised at how quickly my brain fatigues as I'm trying to experiment with a new pattern. So it is all about muscle memory. It is all about practice. It's easy to push forward. It's easy to put sideways, but those, those rotational things are very hard. And part of that is we're trying to do it all with our shoulders. And you realize so much more of it comes from your core and keeping straight and just kind of moving around and finding out that magic placement of where those hands go um, because it's different for all of us so uh yeah so just understand that it does take practice but quilt as you go is lovely i know a, a woman that has done all sorts of wonderful things with quilt as you go she's done uh king size quilts with them yeah Someone says, my first quilt is unfinished. It's pieced and I have hand quilted much of the border. How can I best use low volume fabric? Just think of where you use uh, white and cream and that's the very same places that you would use low volume fabrics. But I've seen absolutely fabulous low volume quilts that they've just made the whole background all scrappy out of them. Um, I know I'm going to be using a low volume print in my light catcher quilt. I'm not sure if you saw my video gemology and that's just going to be a white on, that's a white on white. It's not a pure white, it's white on white and I'll be using that low volume print all in the background. Why do, <laughs> why do machines eat fabric? Sometimes my machine likes to eat fabric at the beginning. Um, the reason why it eats the fabric is, is the fabric's not supported. So the machine, a sewing machine is designed to push a thread down through fabric, catch it on the bottom and pull it back up. And that only works if both the upper thread and the bottom thread is under tension. And it also only works if what it's going, punching through is supported. So that's why we have the presser foot and it holds the fabric flat on both sides of the needle. It's not, it's not, um, so if that 
fabric is not supported and sometimes it's very very flimsy especially if you're doing a half square triangle or something like that um, there's just nothing to hold it in place and that so it when the needle pushes down it takes the fabric down with it and then it gets all a beautiful nest in there um, the truth is you're not alone it happens to everybody uh, things that you can do to prevent it you can uh, uh, you can use a header, so that means that there's definitely tension on that thread, both upper and lower, before you can begin. Um, sometimes your fabric is very delicate, like there's some very lightweight cottons where you're more that's more prone to happen, so you can put some starch in it and give it a little bit more bulk. Um, there's times when I have tried and tried and tried to get through one side and I just realized that the integrity of the fabric on that corner is just not good is just shot and it cannot support a needle going through it so I flip the fabric over and sew it from the other side and I can get through um, sometimes if you're you're working with if you see my video on HSTs or sewing straight you know that I like to trim those points off um, the HST before I begin so I have a flat surface and the presser foot can, can go forward but I recommend watching my video on how to sew straight because it has a lot of other pointers in how to avoid that chewing the fabric. Am I going to do a tutorial on free motion quilting with rulers? I don't have one planned. Uh, there's definitely people that can do one better than me. I know Angela Walters has a number of videos um, that because uh, she, she has her own rulers right so, so she, not only is she wanting you to buy her rulers she's showing you how to use the rulers so it's uh, very good like I mean she's got a master plan for why how to use those rulers and the and the good thing about the Angela Walter series is that they're small you know if you're using long arm rulers often they're much bigger size and the Angela Walter series from Creative Grid are smaller so it works much better in the smaller harp of the domestic sewing machine so uh, yeah check out her channel uh, somebody's asked me how long have I been quilting I have been quilting I think I've, I've picked up my first fabrics back in 2007 but I truly really started quilting back in 2011 2012 um, that's when and then I really picked up steam around 2015 Somebody's asked, what is the name of the quilt behind me? This is Stash Buster number one. My very first quilt. It has been, the video has been seen by quite a few people. So this is Stash Buster number one. Go look up the video. It is one of, it'll be on my home screen of my channel. It is uh, lovely. It, it, it's just a, a lovely, fast quilt to do. You can do it. If you, if you concentrate, you can cut the fabric in the morning, you can piece it in the afternoon, and you can quilt it at night. It really is an easy one. It's got a really nice soft wave going through it. And uh, yeah, it's an, a fast one. But I recommend taking a couple of days to do it instead of trying to cram it all into one. When are you showing us how to store our fabric in the declutter challenge? I think that's probably in about three weeks. Next week, um, my video is going to be about how to sew in a small sp space. I get a lot of people asking me, uh, yeah, it's fine and dandy when you've got a nice big sewing room to lay everything out, but how do you do it in a tiny condo? Or how do you do it in a bedroom? So uh, yeah, that's what my video is about next week. Okay, this is an interesting question. This is from Christine Hammett. She says, I'm a very simple pattern quilter. How do I respond to someone that repeatedly speaks up in show and tell to tell again, tell her again that she takes the easy way out? So there's a number of different dynamics going on in this. So this is sort of somebody who's speaking up during show and tell and saying something that uh, hurts. Um, so that's the one dynamic. You're hearing a message and you're taking it personally. It's hurting you. It's, um, it's making you feel shame. The, 
When people say hurtful things, I find the very important thing to do is to turn around and just turn it around and say, why is she saying that to me? Because yes, you feel the shame in everything, but it's not so much about you, it's about them. Why are they feeling the need to speak up and say something hurtful? So take the take the personal part of it out and why is this person sitting in the crowd saying you should try harder there are a type of people that have an economy with words and there's not a lot of pleases and thank yous in the way that they talk they just tell it as it is there's just for lack of a better word just an economy with what they're saying so they're looking at something and they're looking at you and they're saying you should try harder take that information and you can digest it and deal with it and consider should I tr should I try harder or um, just t take a moment and just do some self reflection on that why am I doing this easy um, and should I try harder and the answer could be I'm just doing this because I want something fast easy and a no brainer and that's a totally justified answer but maybe it might dig out something else it might dig out why am I taking the easy route um, am I scared um, you know and just take the advice for maybe the way it was intended and take out the shame and take out the um, uh, the lack of confidence out of that statement and just think should I be trying harder but the answer could be again if your answer is this is what I like and this is what I, I only want to do this then that that's the answer and the other thing is why would somebody do that why would somebody do something to make you feel bad so is she really intentionally trying to make you feel bad <laughs> Or is she, again, just being economy with words and just doesn't think before she says anything? So um, if she's being a bully, that means maybe this is the one place that she can feel strong um, and you can uh, sympathize for her that she's in that type of situation. Um, or um, you can recognize that this is just the way she is. She just tells it like it is. And that means it's not you. It's just the way she is. So I know things can can be very hurtful, um, but just sometimes you just need to take a step back from that question or what the person is saying and just really f try and figure out where it's coming from and what it really means. I've often found when people are that way, it's good to get to know them. It's really good to get, get to know them and uh, sort of find out where they're coming from. And sometimes they've got lots of lots of tips and tricks and help that they can provide you because uh, that's really what they're broadcasting. They know something and they're just waiting to share that information, but they just don't have the social skills to go out there and become fr friends with other people. So that's my advice when people are hurtful. What brand of quarter inch presser foot is best? Well, I would say the one that's accurately quarter of an inch. <laughs> Sandy, I'm sorry, I do not know all the various different brands of a quarter inch foot, uh, but regardless of whether the quarter inch, uh, the presser foot is a quarter of an inch, you still have to measure every single time to be sure that the fabrics that you're sewing on and once you um, iron them and flip them over is giving you the accuracy in your quarter inch foot your quarter inch seam I should say it's not about the foot it's about the seam and the quarter inch foot is only a guideline it is giving you this is where quarter inch is approximately but you still need to take some practice uh, pieces and figure out where it is accurately and it may be a little bit left maybe a little bit right and that's why I always use that sewing ledge so I can um, have that wall to butt my seams up against which I know I've tested for and I can just slightly move it slightly move it and adjust it as I need it okay uh, last question here any suggestions to to minimize the appearance of seam ripped holes um, she's uh, Barb I think it's Jenier has just done some some work and she has to return the quilt she right now she just rubs or scratches with her fingernails but hopes there's perhaps a more elegant option. I find spritzing 
my surface with water and just letting it sit um, often helps relax those. And then I give it a little bit of, of an iron and it helps them disappear. That is what I do. And I also do the finger, <laughs> the fingernail thing as well. It's hard because not only is the needle, um, you're hoping your needle is going down uh, between the web, uh, your hope, but sometimes the needle goes down actually through the threads. So that's very hard. And it's sometimes when the thread goes, uh, the needle goes down, it actually rolls the thread a bit. And since your uh, quilting cotton is printed on the top, um, sometimes it can seem what, uh, be white. And there's not much you can do about those, unfortunately. So uh, that's about all we have time for today. I cannot believe that 40 minutes has gone by so quickly. Uh, again, if you saw this quilt, this was Stash Buster number one. There's a video about it. You can find it on my website. Uh, there's a downloadable pattern. Uh, fast, easy, just so easy. And it looks like so much work because <laughs> it gives the illusion that you've been piecing for hours and hours. <laughs> Uh, what else? Uh, last week on Karen's Quilt Circle was Stephanie Hackney from Hobbs Batting. She was fabulous. Oh my lord. She answered, I had sat down and thought of all your questions and I just asked them all and she gave some very, very good advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. Watch it. And uh, she also had a, a number of really good handouts on her website. So I have the link to those in the notes. And next, uh, not this week, but next week, I'm going to have Wendy Chow. She's the weekend quilter and her book is Urban Quilting. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook. I just want to let you know, uh, Brandy notified me this morning that there's a person out there posing as me. Uh, they're Facebook page is called Done Quilt. They've been posting pictures of Stash, Stash Buster number eight claiming to be me. So just be aware that that is not me. I have not been hacked or anything like that. They're just posing as me. Stash Buster number eight went live last week and I would have wanted to show that quilt to you, but my son grabbed it before, <laughs> before I could. <laughs> fitted his living room perfectly. I didn't even know that as I was making it. So, uh, sorry, <laughs> I only have the pictures to show on that one. I'm going to have to make another one. So I'll have one on my wall. Anyways, uh, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. You, of course, my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for showing up today. I really appreciate it. It's amazing how fast time with friends go and take care and I'll see you next time. Bye.